Happy October! Like I said last year, I would be discontinuing Monster Madness as a 31 day marathon. Instead I would be making more videos spread throughout the year, and that's exactly what I've been doing with weekly movie reviews all year long. And now that it's October, of course we should delve back into horror. The 10 year history of Monster Madness is behind us, but now I give you Son of Monster Madness with a new video every Sunday Bloody Sunday. The rest of the month will be filled out with reruns. They're old videos, but they'll be seen on YouTube for the first time. I hope this adds a little Halloween spirit for you this month because that's the whole point. Let's start it off with Gargoyles, a 1972 made-for-TV movie. I can't say I've heard of that many movies to feature gargoyles. It's usually vampires or werewolves. I saw this movie on TV sometime in the 80s, and then it faded into obscurity. But there's still lots of people out there who remember it. For those coming to it fresh, it may seem real cheesy, but if you were young when you first saw it, it's one of those things that sticks in your mind. Today it's not that special, but back then it was pretty cool. My favorite part is the opening. It starts out like a documentary explaining the history of gargoyles. Basically, according to the film, they're the army of Satan who are reborn every 600 years to battle humans for supremacy of the world because for Satan, having only hell wasn't enough. I like all the artwork and stock images, and the narrator voice plays it straight like it's something you'd watch in school. Then it cuts to this green, slimy title that lets you know the movie itself will not be as serious. An author who's writing a book on the supernatural brings his daughter with him on a road trip to meet a museum owner who claims to have an interesting artifact to discuss. When they get there, they see the museum is just some old beaten down shack out in the desert, and the owner seems like he hasn't had a visitor in years. He shows them the artifact, which is a gargoyle skeleton. The author laughs him off and tries to leave, but soon the shack is ambushed by the gargoyles, presumably. They're off camera, but we hear wings flapping. The shack gets lit on fire, the owner dies, and the father and daughter escape. A bunch of other stuff happens. They go to the police, who blame a group of motorcycle riders as being responsible for the arson, but those gar things, as they're once called, show up, and in the final act, hold the father and daughter captive. They want the humans to educate them and to coexist, but that plan falls flat. The plot is pretty generic, and the movie abruptly stops without an ending, as if they left it unfinished, or it was meant to be a cliffhanger for part two, which never happened. But it doesn't even feel like a cliffhanger. It's like the movie just stops. But let's talk about these gargoyles. Obviously, they're actors in suits and prosthetics. They sort of remind me of the flying monkeys in Wizard of Oz, except you never see a gargoyle fly until the very end. On one hand, they look kind of silly, but also appealing in the same way as classic monsters like Creature from the Black Lagoon. And it's pretty good considering this was made for television, which in those days didn't have the same kind of budget that television has now. The gargoyle effects were created by Stan Winston and won an Emmy. Lots of times the gargoyles are shot in slow motion, which may seem like an odd choice, but somehow it creates a spooky effect. When you see that weird choppy slow-mo accompanied with that steady drone and weird sound effects like it's just creepy. These are the only parts I can vividly remember seeing as a kid. As an adult, I can understand why, because it's so odd. The lead gargoyle was played by a football player, Bernie Casey, but little known, he was voiced by Vic Perrin, who did the control voice for the intro of The Outer Limits. I don't have much else to say about this movie. It's getting harder for me to find films that overflow me with insightful thoughts to pour out, but the things I wish to say don't need many words. It's just that, for those who saw it as a kid, Gargoyles is a film that brings you back to a simpler time when a person in a monster costume was scary. <laughs> Just when you thought there were no more classic horror films left for me to review, there's The Most Dangerous Game from 1932. The best way I can describe this is, it's like the old dark house combined with Predator. I'll explain. 
Imagine if you took the plot of the old dark house with people stranded having to spend the night in a creepy old house, but the house is a castle straight out of Dracula with archways and candles, and the host is a count. Basically, if you took Dracula and made him a regular human, not a vampire. And the castle is on a tropical island, so now it's also a jungle adventure. The Count sends his guests out into the jungle to hunt them for sport, and that's where the predator aspect comes into it, because of all these stalking scenes. But the jungle is the same jungle set from King Kong, plus the same cast, Faye Ray and Robert Armstrong are in it, with the same composer, Max Steiner, and the same producer-director team of Marion Cooper and Ernest Shodzak. Basically, when RKO was making King Kong, they were also making the most dangerous game at the same time. Don't you think it was enough to make one masterpiece? Like, how could you focus on making this movie when you were also making King Kong? Kong was a huge monumental leap in film evolution. The Most Dangerous Game was also a success, but more modest, and nobody talks about it as much today. It was based on a book by Richard Connell from 1924. The film helps create all the classic horror tropes. Robert Rainsford is the last survivor of a shipwreck who gets stranded on an island. He arrives at the castle and right away meets a mute servant named Yvonne who does nothing but stare creepily. This was the same year as The Old Dark House with the mute servant Morgan, played by Boris Karloff. Today, everyone knows this cliché of the creepy butler or the villain's henchman, the Renfield to Dracula, the Fritz to Frankenstein. Then the Count, Zaroff, descends the staircase, which is the way they always have to appear. They can't just open a door and say hi. They have to show up elegantly at the top of the stairs to look sophisticated and powerful. There's always shadowy close-ups of his face, and everything he says has a sinister subtext, like, the pleasure is all mine. He's played by a guy named Leslie Banks, but man, would this have been a perfect role for Bela Lugosi or if it was made a decade or two later, Vincent Price. Also staying at the castle are a brother and sister, Eve and Martin, Fay Ray and Robert Armstrong, who just happen to have been shipwrecked too, but soon it becomes apparent that it's no coincidence. After Martin goes missing, Rainsford and Eve sneak into the basement, lit only by candle, which is basically every horror movie ever made. Then they're shocked to see an old decapitated head on the wall, which was pretty gruesome for 1932. Then they find Martin's dead body and realize that Zaroff's whole plan is to cause ships to crash by moving the channel markers, luring people in for prey for his big hunting game. He has a huge passion for hunting, but after hunting every kind of animal, he got bored and moved on to people. The head on the wall is one of his trophies. One of these props actually went up for auction in 2003, but I haven't been able to find the same prop in the movie. Maybe it's there, I just haven't been able to verify it. The one seen in the close-up is clearly a different head. I could accept the hair on the prop went missing, but the mouth is closed when the one in the movie is showing teeth. I also heard that the scene was considered so gruesome, just the idea of dead people being mounted on the walls was enough for them to have to cut the scene shorter. And this prop head does seem to appear on the press book, so it's possible it was cut from the film. Then Zaroff sends Rainsford and Eve into the jungle, giving them a head start, hunting them only from midnight to sunrise. The game is simple. They have till morning to survive, and if they last that long, he'll let them go. There's multiple phases. First, Zaroff uses a bow and arrow, then a rifle, and then he unleashes a bunch of hungry dogs. Rainsford and Eve have to think of many ways to outsmart him, like setting up a trap using vines and tree trunks. They also lead him into a foggy swamp, hoping he'll lose sight of them. Once they're in the fog, that's when you realize they're using the same set as King Kong. They even run across the same fallen tree. You almost expect Kong to show up and eat Zaroff. There's nothing else I can say without over-explaining it or spoiling it. You should see it for yourself. It's only an hour long. It's totally worth it, not just for the historical aspect and seeing those early horror tropes at play, but it's still a good movie full of suspense. It seems to study the relationship between the hunter and the hunted. It asks the question, what would it be like if you were the prey? All around, it's well-made and is an underrated classic from the golden age of horror. In 
the 80s, there were lots of movies about small creatures running amok, like this one, Hobgoblins, which many say is a low-rent version of Gremlins, but I'd reserve that description for Ghoulies. That's still a big step above Hobgoblins, and that's saying something for a movie that has a poster with a monster coming out of a toilet. Hobgoblins is the shit that movie dumped out. But I do prefer it over Ghoulies. It's celebrated for being crap. It was featured on Mystery Science Theater 3000 and has a cult fan base. It's extremely low budget. According to the director's commentary track, they didn't even pay for any of the locations, so they only shot in places they could get for free or get away with without permission. You can easily tell they had a small budget to work with, and to a certain degree, every movie is a result of circumstance. They didn't have the money, or there were certain problems that came up, or whatever, but then there's those weird decisions that go without any plausible excuse. The scene that stands out is when two of the characters have a fight with garden tools. The reason for the fight is bizarre. One of the guys just got home from the army and wants to show off how tough he is. The actual fight is even more bizarre. They basically click the garden tools together repeatedly for over two minutes straight. And then the aftermath for the fight is the most bizarre yet. The army guy's girlfriend is happy that he just beat this poor guy to the ground. She calls him his hero and then runs into a van with him to have sex, which is shown by having the van like rock back and forth with a cartoon bouncing sound effect. Then the loser's girlfriend gets mad at him for not being man enough or whatever. Why doesn't anyone help him up or ask him if he's all right? Why do the girls want to incite violence? Who fights with garden tools anyway? This is the type of stuff you can't make up. When you see characters behave in this way, it detaches you from reality and lets you know that you're in for a ride. Like this is a movie where anything can happen, so get ready. Naturally, the main reason you'd watch a movie like this is for the creatures. For the first 30 minutes, the hobgoblins are not shown, even though there's plenty of opportunities. It seems like it's going to be one of those films that keeps them to a minimum to hide the poor special effects. But then, all of a sudden, there they are, and your first sight of them is in close detail and lasting long enough to notice every flaw. To be honest, I think they look pretty cool. The only problem is the movement, or lack of. They're basically just like stuffed toys, and if they sold toys of these, I'd want one. The only way they move is by the puppeteers jiggling them around, and sometimes it's just the actors moving them. It looks real funny. At least one of them is a puppet so it can move its mouth, but that's the best it gets. With all the screen time the hobgoblins get, I'm surprised that not once have I ever noticed a puppeteer's hand. My favorite moments are when the hobgoblins pop into the frame and just hang out, unnoticed by the human characters. It happens a lot, like they're just sitting there, just bobbing their heads. The effects artist said that the idea was to make something that looked like a hybrid between the two types of gremlins, the mogwai form and the post-metamorphosis form. But to me, they remind me more of critters, especially since they come down in a spaceship. The gremlins were repelled by bright light, but the hobgoblins are attracted to bright light. At least that's what you're told, but it doesn't seem to affect the plot much. Another fun fact is that the growling sounds the hobgoblins make is from a pit bull, but it was a test recording for gremlins that was never used, so hobgoblins literally uses leftovers from gremlins. Other than that, there's no more similarities. The real strange thing is that the hobgoblins have the ability to make people's fantasies come true, but something in the fantasy goes wrong and kills them. So that's how the hobgoblins kill people, through their minds. It's a concept that is overly complicated for a movie of this nature. For example, there's a guy who keeps calling a sex hotline. One of those scenes was cut from the Mystery Science Theater version. But anyway, the girl on the phone magically appears before him and leads him into his car where she tries to push him off a cliff. This whole fantasy thing is a lot to grasp when just having a bunch of monsters running around would have been enough. But every weird idea the movie has to offer seems to culminate in one 20-minute scene at a nightclub called Club Scum. 
I don't even know where to begin. There's a waitress with a Marge Simpson hairdo who also dances on stage. There's a generic band that gets way too much attention. Like, did we need to hear the whole song? Then more weird fantasies happen. The army guy starts throwing grenades and eventually gets himself blown up. It just moves from one thing to the next, all within the same location. The director, Rick Sloan, seems very aware of how ludicrous the film is. On the commentary track, he points out all kinds of continuity errors that I would have never noticed. <laughs> he seems to understand the cult fan base. With some directors, that's not the case. The director of Troll 2 seems to get kind of offended when people call it the worst movie. At least that's the impression I get from the documentary Best Worst Movie. He doesn't seem to go along with the perception of it being so bad it's good. But with Hobgoblins, Rick Sloan totally gets it. A sequel was made in 2009, which retains the same sloppy, low-budget feel. What I'd like to see is all these different small creatures join forces or fight. Ghoulies versus Hobgoblins versus Munchies versus Freddy Freaker. 1-900-490-FREAK. 1-900-490-FREAK. <laughs> I already reviewed the first three Exorcist movies. It's a series that had uh, very unusual results. Nobody really knew what to do with any of the sequels or that it ever required sequels at all. But then came along a prequel in 2004. This would address what happened with Father Marin before the first film. The opening scene when he's digging in Iraq and finds the demon statue implies that he's seen it before somewhere, and when he performs the exorcism on Reagan, we can tell this is not the first time he's done this. And in the book, it's told that he once battled the demon in Africa. So to me, the idea of a prequel was very welcome. Yes, I love the character of Father Marin, and of course I'd want to see a whole movie dedicated to him and the events before the exorcist. But here's the thing. The true curse of the Exorcist movie is that it was the only one capable of being good. Every sequel had some horrible fate. Exorcist 2 was one of the worst sequels ever made. Exorcist 3 had moments where it was great, but it was so mixed. And the prequel, well, when the studio saw the finished product, they scrapped it and started over again. They hired a new director and a new cast and made the movie a second time. It was released with the title, The Exorcist, The Beginning, and it flopped miserably, both financially and critically. So, oops, they went back and released the first version, calling it Dominion, prequel to The Exorcist, and that version flopped too. <laughs> so, I don't know where to go with this. I'm kind of reviewing two movies here, but it's the same movie, just done twice. Oh, but of course you're probably thinking they must be totally different. Why else would you remake the same thing? I don't know, the same reason they remade fucking Psycho. No, this is a different situation. In fact, it's probably the only situation I can think of where something like this happened in this same way. Halloween 6 had alternate scene shot, but this, the whole movie was reshot. Well, I guess I'll start by talking about Dominion, even though it was released after it was the first to be made. Father Marin is played by Stellan Starsgard, and there's a really interesting fun fact here. In The Exorcist, Marin is played by Max von Sydow, who was only 44 years old at the time it was filmed. They used makeup to make him appear older. At the time the prequel was made, Skarsgard would have been about 53. That's definitely a rare situation when an older actor is playing the younger version of a character and the younger actor is playing the older version. Anyway, I find Skarsgård to be pretty damn good. At least this movie has a good lead. He's not the spitting image of Max von Sydow, but I can still accept him as the young Father Marin. The main plot goes like this. During World War II, Marin is forced by a Nazi officer into participating in the public execution of people in a small town. After that, he loses his faith, no longer a priest, and becomes an archaeologist. 
In Africa, he becomes involved in the digging of an underground church that somehow existed before Christianity and seems to have been buried deliberately. He discovers beneath the church is a crypt with demonic idols, a place of evil worship where people were sacrificed. The church was built on top to seal the evil in the ground, but this is only one small part of the movie. To describe the rest would mean having to walk you through every scene. Too much happens. There's tension with the natives who are afraid of what's going on, and even the military gets involved. And in the center of the whole thing, there's a young boy who's being treated for an illness, but it soon turns out he's possessed by the demon, of course. The name Pazuzu from the book is never mentioned, and not in the original movie either. Only Exorcist 2 got that part down. At the end, the boy becomes a hairless, levitating, diaper-wearing incarnation of evil. There's one tiny moment where a demon face appears over his real face. It's one of the worst effects I've ever seen for a movie that takes itself so seriously. It looks like Jim Carrey in The Mask. SOMEBODY STOP ME! As expected, Marin becomes a priest again and drives the demon out. Overall, it's a very forgettable movie. There's nothing that bad about it, and it does have some great acting, mainly from a supporting character, Father Francis, played by Gabriel Mann. He cries, he acts his ass off, but after it's all over, the movie feels empty and is not satisfying as a prequel to The Exorcist. Now, on to The Exorcist The Beginning. Like I said, it's basically the same movie. The plot is almost the same, or let me put it this way, it goes from the same point A to point B, just takes a slightly different path to get there. The scenes are different, but they only support the same overall plot. Father Marin is the only actor that's the same. The new actor playing Father Francis is nowhere near as good, meaning in this particular movie. There is a line of dialogue that stuck out to me that wasn't in the Dominion version, where it said the evil sanctuary was built on the spot where Lucifer fell from heaven. Just hearing that simple explanation heightened my interest. Otherwise, it's just an evil spot. Who cares? That's like any movie. But it's the spot where Lucifer fell. Like, okay, that makes it more unique. Also, the statue from the first movie makes an appearance. Wow, we needed that. The original movie sets up the idea that he saw this statue before. Now we actually get to see that happen. If this is an exorcist movie, then yes, please give us more connections with the original movie. I'm in favor of that. The biggest change is the ending. The doctor character, Sarah, is the one who's possessed, and she actually takes on a similar appearance as Regan from the original. She spouts out vulgarities and climbs on the walls. It's like a breath of fresh air to actually see something that resembles an exorcist movie. But even so, this final scene feels tacked on, like it was a last minute idea. If they took all that time to reshoot the entire movie, why couldn't they work this in better? There's still a boy who's being treated the whole time, like he's the one who's gonna be possessed, but instead, in the last scene, it turns out to be her. Why couldn't she be the one the whole time? It's clearly meant for commercial value to give the audience what they want, but the rest takes itself so seriously and becomes such a snoozer that this ending comes as a real wake up and leaves you on high energy. So there's good and bad. Which version's better? I don't really know. Dominion has more of a consistent tone. Exorcist the Beginning is more satisfying though, but in a cheap way. Both films look great, I'll give them that, and they tried. They really tried. Both take themselves extremely seriously, minus a few seconds worth of bad effects that take you out of it, but they take themselves a little bit too seriously, like they're trying to make Schindler's List. The first movie was a simple premise. It's a demon that possesses somebody. It took something that could have come off as campy, but these prequels tried so hard to steer so far away from campy that they went too far off course, not realizing that being campy and being a masterpiece are actually closer together than most people think. <laughs> Thank you.
It's hard for me to get excited about new horror films. I feel like everything's been done already, but whenever I hear good things about a particular film, I see it eventually, and there's been a lot of good ones in recent years. If I had to pick just one, I'd go with Don't Breathe. With a title like that, it seems almost like a spoof of all those don't movies. Don't be afraid of the dark, don't go in the woods, don't go near the park, don't look in the basement, don't open the door, and this one, don't even breathe. But if anything, it's just a marketable title. When I watched this, it got me fired up. After it was over, I was like, damn, horror is still alive. Now lots of people like to avoid that term, like, no, this is a thriller. Uh, but that's where the best horror movies reside, on that fine line where you're not sure exactly what genre it is. The plot is simple. It's about a group of thieves who try to rob a blind man. They break into his house at night only to find out this guy is one tough motherfucker and a war vet. Right off the bat, we're stuck with these unsympathetic characters. They're trying to rob somebody. There's no way we're going to root for them. So at first, I'm just waiting to see them get killed, like in any horror movie. I'm definitely taking the blind man side, but I'm not going to spoil anything, so I'll just speak vaguely here. As the film goes on, they realize there's more going on in this house than they thought, and... There's no good person here. Everybody's bad in some way. But each of them has a clear motive to why they're doing bad things. And their motives are created out of past tragedies. You can tell exactly what each of them's trying to do and why they're trying to do it. After all the suffering, you just want to see it end. You, you stick it through to the nail-biting finish. You just want to see everybody be okay and hope they learn their lessons. But something keeps happening to prolong the horror. Just one thing, there's a dog that comes after the thieves. So whenever the man is out of the picture, the dog is the problem. But then as soon as the dog isn't there, the man comes back. And then the dog's back. It just creates this nerve-wracking experience. For something that could be as simple as just get out of the house, they put enough barriers in the way to keep it going. The suspense is so great, it becomes almost unbearable. It really put me on the edge of my seat. The cinematography is amazing. There's lots of nice moving shots, but also a good eye for light and dark. The darkest scenes give us just the right amount of ambient light. It never looks like movie lighting. It just looks like what your natural eyes would see. There's also a scene that takes place in total darkness, but they allow us to see what's happening with a muted gray wash over it. You can see the actor's eyes dilated, and it's totally convincing that it's supposed to be dark. Other movies would just make everything look blue, you know, which never really made sense. This is the first time I've seen darkness done well. And of course the man is blind, so when everything goes dark, he has the upper hand. It reminds me of the movie Wait Until Dark from 1967, where a blind woman defends herself from criminals by breaking all the lights in her house just so that the criminals are just as blind as her. But of course, with anybody who's accustomed to being blind, from what I've heard, you use the rest of your senses to your full advantage, which all become higher than average. Is there anything I didn't like about the movie? Well, there's a few plot details, which I won't go into, that make you question certain things. So not everything is 100% perfect, and there is one specific moment that probably went too far. If you saw it, you may know what I'm talking about. I think it's similar to the moment in Misery, when Paul finally gets the upper hand and takes the pages of the book and shoves it into Annie's mouth. Uh, here, something else gets shoved into somebody's mouth, and... It comes off as overly comical, or it's just a laugh-out-loud crowd exciter, a relief in an otherwise bleak film. Not much else to say. Check it out. Not perfect, but I think it's one of the best horror films I've seen in a while. There's lots of other good ones recently, too, and hopefully um, there's a lot more good ones on the way. Hey.